Well, y'all know how to get real quiet real quick. <laughs> okay. Hello, welcome to Green Apple Books on the Park. Thank you so much for joining us for the launch of Ada Limon's The Hurting Kind. <laughs> Uh, Ada is joined tonight by remarkable, remarkable Bay Area poet, Matthew Zapruder. Please give a hand for Matthew. And the really dynamite duo that we have um, tonight. I'm going to keep my announcements very brief because I know you are all very excited to get to the heart of the matter. So I will say, uh, first of all, thank you for showing your proof of vax when you got in. Um, we're asking that folks just keep their mask on between sips of beverages. We do have some beverages at this little table here, if you can get to it. Um, Ada was also so kind to bring hurting kind lollipops that are also on our refreshment table. What do you, I, I know, like a tie-in, a poetry candy tie-in is pretty great. Um, so that's pretty exceptional if you're able to, to snack on one of those, do recommend. Uh, there's also some stickers so everyone can can take one home, which is also another pretty exceptional merch item and thing to take away from this evening. Um, I would encourage you all, if you are here and if you like poetry, to check out our full list of events on our website at greenapplebooks.com. I'm a little biased, but our May calendar is really great, um, as is our June and our July. And uh, the rest of the season going forward is like truly, sincerely, we have some really great folks coming through. And I hope that you can join us uh, when they do. And I'll just say very briefly that uh, this is a great week for poetry because we have this tonight. And then on Thursday, we are hosting Mancho Alvarado for the launch of her collection, Greyhound Americans. I'm a big fan of Mancho. This is her debut collection. We're also going to be joined by some Bay Area greats, Josiah Luis Alderete, Derek Austin, Sam Sachs, and Mancho invited me to join as well, so I get to join too, which is very sweet. Oh, thank you. Um, I never like to book myself, but she asked me, so I'm doing it. <laughs> um, and that's this coming Thursday right here at 7 p.m. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the folks that are joining us this evening. We're going to have a reading, and then we're going to hear a conversation between Ada and Matthew, and then we're going to get to um, an audience Q&A. How does that sound? Thank you. Okay, I like that plan too. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce this person on my left here. Matthew Zapruder is the author of four collections of poetry, most recently, Come On All You Ghosts, a New York Times notable book of the year, and Sun Bear, as well as Why Poetry. He has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, a William Carlos Williams Award, and a May Sarton Award from the Academy of American Arts and Sciences. His poetry has been adapted and performed at Carnegie Hall by composer Gabriel Tahani and Brooklyn writer, and was the libretto for Vespers for a New Dark Age a piece by composer Missy Mazzoli. In 2000, he co-founded Verse Press and is now editor at large at Wave Books. From 2016 to 2017, he held the annually rotating position of editor of the poetry column for the New York Times Magazine. He lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. This bio doesn't mention Father's Day. It doesn't mention his collection Father's Day, which you should also check out and is available. Um, why poetry is also a personal favorite. But it's not about my personal favorites. Please do welcome Matthew Zapruder. Um, and last but most certainly not least, Ada Limon is the author of The Hurting Kind, as well as five other collections of poetry. These include most recently The Carrying, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award and was named a finalist for the Penn Jean Stein Book Award and Bright Dead Things, which was named uh, a finalist for the National Book Award, National Book Critics Circle Award and the Kingsley Tufts Award. Lamone is a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and her work has appeared in the New Yorker, the New York Times and American Poetry Review among many others. She is the host of American Public Media's weekday poetry podcast, The Slowdown. Born and raised in California, she's back, yay. She now lives in Lexington, Kentucky, and we are here celebrating the hurting time tonight. Please join me in welcoming Ada Limon. Here we 
again this one well i think this is the mic for the room and this is the mic for the zoom is that right that's correct oh great so i don't read out of that one i read out of this one yeah there's so many mics <laughs> there's mics everywhere you look hello it's so amazing to see you all um this is really beautiful thank you i'm really moved um i'm gonna try to keep it together um which is i guess the story of my life <laughs> just trying to keep it together <laughs> um it's such a pleasure to be here and um this day is so wild to me that this book is here and in the world and it is its birthday is may 10th um this taurus taurus baby um and uh, I thought I would start with a poem about a bird. Um, yeah, I'm gonna read five poems, just so you know. And uh, then we'll get into some questions, conversation. It's just so lovely to see all your faces. Drowning Creek, past the strip malls and the power plants, out of the holler, past Gun Bottom Road and Brassfield, and before Red Lick Creek, there's a stream called Drowning Creek where I saw the prettiest bird I'd seen all year. The belted kingfisher, crested in its Aegean blue plumage, perched not on a high snag, but on a transmission wire, eyeing the creek for crayfish, tadpoles, and minnows. We were driving fast toward home and already our minds were pulled taut like a high black wire latched to a utility pole. I wanted to stop, stop the car, to take a closer look at the solitary stocky water bird with its blue crown and its blue chest and its uncommonness. But already we were a blur and miles beyond the flying fisher by the time I had realized what I'd witnessed. People, were nothing to that bird hovering over the creek. I was nothing to that bird, which wasn't concerned with history's bloody battles or why this creek was called Drowning Creek, a name I love, though it gives me shivers because it sounds like an order, a place where one goes to drown. The bird doesn't call the creek that name. The bird doesn't call it anything. I'm almost certain, though I'm certain of nothing. There is a solitude in this world I cannot pierce. I would die for it. Thank you. I thought I would read a um, Sonoma Coast poem. Um, this is a poem uh, from my stepfather, and it's about whale watching and being a child and um, realizing the patience of watching the horizon and the water is not really what children are gifted with. <laughs> um, so, you know, my parents kept seeing a whale and I was like, you know, okay, fine. Sure you did, <laughs> you know, my, my head down to see what was right in front of me. So this is a poem about that. Stillwater Cove. It seemed a furtive magic sun ricocheting off cresting waves near Stillwater Cove, the soft rock cliffs of sandstone and clay, the wind-tilted cypress trees leaning towards the blue Pacific, and it was only you who'd see them, a migrating pod of gray whales going northward, new calves in tow, shooting a spray of frothy expelled water from their blowholes and making a show of breaching in the clear spring air off the coastline. We'd whine that we never caught a glimpse of a slick back or a tail slap, nary a spy hopping head raised above the swirling surface. Too young to look outward for long, we'd lower our eyes toward what lived small, the alligator lizard in the coyote brush, the bracken fern, orange monkey flower, the beach fly, the earwig, the tick. It was your trick always a whale as soon as our heads went down. Had to have been a lie. They'd come up while we zeroed in on Mexican sage or the monarch, distracted by the evidence of life at our feet. We had no time 
for the waiting that was required. To watch the waves until the whales surfaced seemed like a maddening task. Now I am in the inland air that smells of smoke and gasoline, the trees blown leafless by the wind. Could you refuse me if I asked you to point again at the horizon, to tell me something was worth waiting for? Thank you. Um, this is a poem for my brother, my older brother, who's here somewhere, I think. Oh, just, oh, there he is. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah. Cyrus and the snakes. My brother holds a snake by its head. The whole length of the snake is the length of my brother's body. The snake's head is held safely, securely, as if my brother is showing it something in the distant high grass. I don't know why he wants to hold them. Their strong bodies wrapping themselves around the warmth of his arm, constricting and made of circles and momentum, slippery coolness smooth against the ground. Still, this image of him Holding a snake as it snakes as snakes do, both a noun and a verb and a story that doesn't end well. Once we stole an egg from the backyard chicken coop and cracked it just to see what was inside. A whole unhatched chick where we expected yolk and mucus was an unfeathered and unfurled sweetness. We stared at the thing dead now and unshelled by curiosity and terrible youth. My brother pretended not to care so much while I cried, though only a little. Still, we buried it in the brush by the creeping thistle that tore up our arms with their speared leaves, barbed at the ends like weapons stuck in the rattlesnake grass. But I knew, I knew that he'd cry if he was alone, if he wasn't a boy in the summer heat, being a boy, in the summer heat. Years later, back from Mexico or South America, he'd admit he was tired of history, of always discovering the ruin by ruining it, wrecking a forest for a temple, a temple that should be simply left a temple. He wanted it to stay as it was, even if it went undiscovered. I want to honor a man who wants to hold a wild thing only for a second, long enough to admire it fully, and then wants to watch it safely return to its life, bends to be sure the grass closes up behind it. And this is a poem um, that I wrote um, really trying to figure out what it was that I loved about the sounds of sports. And it was so fun walking around San Francisco today. I was thinking, I kept getting excited when I saw San Francisco Giants paraphernalia. And then I realized it was, of course, <laughs> we're in San Francisco. But I kept being like, yeah, go Giants. You know, like if I saw one in Kentucky, I would completely freak out. Um, so this was sort of an investigation of why sports, why sports? That's my, my follow-up to your book. Yeah. <laughs> Why sports? <laughs> sports. I've seen my fair share of baseball games, eaten smothered hot dogs in Kansas City and carne asada burritos in San Francisco in the sunny stands on a day free of fog. I've sat in a bar for hours watching basketball and baseball and the Super Bowl, and I've even high-fived and clinked my almost empty drink with a stranger because it felt good to go through something together, even though we hadn't been through anything <laughs> but the drama of a game, its players. If I am honest, what I love, why I love, the sounds of the game, even when I'm not interested, half listening is one thing. When my father and my stepfather 
had to be in the same room or had to drop my brother and me off during our weekly move from one house to another. They, for a brief moment, would stand together in the doorway or on the gravel driveway, and it felt like what true terror should feel like. <laughs> Two men who were so different, you could barely see their shadows attached in the same way. And just when I thought, I couldn't watch the pause lengthen between them. They'd talk about the playoffs or the finals or whatever team was doing whatever thing required that season. And sometimes they'd even shrug or make a motion that felt like two people who weren't opposites after all. Once I sat in the car and waited for one of them to take me away from the back seat, I swear they looked like they were on the same team. <laughs> United against a common enemy had been fighting all this time on the same side. And then I'll um, read the last poem of the book, uh, which I wrote when um, I felt like poetry had let me down <laughs> uh, because I was in a moment of the pandemic in the early stages of it. And I was very fearful and worried about everyone. And um, it turns out poetry is not a vaccine. <laughs> it's also not therapy. <laughs> it can help, it definitely can help. But I, I, was, um, I was anxious and uh, every subject that I sort of tried to peruse in my mind, I didn't wanna do it. And um, of course, what does a poet do when they feel like poetry has let them down? They write a poem about it. doesn't stop. You try to get out, you try to get back in. Yeah. The end of poetry. Enough of osseous and chickadee and sunflower and snowshoes, maple and seeds, samara and shoot. Enough chioscuro, enough of thus and prophecy and the stoic farmer and faith in our father and tis of thee. Enough of bosom and bud skin and God not forgetting and star bodies and frozen birds, enough of the will to go on and not go on or how a certain light does a certain thing. Enough of the kneeling and the rising and the looking inward and the looking up. Enough of the gun, the drama and the acquaintance's suicide, the long lost letter on the dresser. Enough of the longing and the ego and the obliteration of ego. Enough of the mother and the child and the father and the child, and enough of the pointing to the world, weary and desperate, enough of the brutal and the border, enough of can you see me, can you hear me, enough I am human, enough I am alone and I am desperate, enough of the animal saving me, enough of the high water, enough sorrow, enough of the air and its ease, I am asking you to touch me. Um, that was great. I'm so glad you read that last poem. Oh, I'm so glad you. you read. I'm so glad to see everybody. It's really weird. Um, <laughs> it's it's beautiful. It's like, um, and I feel like it's so great that we're coming out to celebrate Ada's poems, um, which feels so full of like life, obviously, but also acknowledgement of the last several years. And it's I can't think of a better way to, you know. Kind of, uh, this is my first public event in several years, so I'm just so honored that you would ask me. And um, I love this book, and I'm excited to talk about it. I have lots of questions, but I'm going to keep myself under control so I can uh, let you all ask questions. So be ready. I'll probably ask a few questions and then be ready with your questions. So um, that felt professorial. I apologize. Um, so um, the uh, gosh, there's so many things. To talk I was going to start in a whole different place, but I want to ask you about the last poem yeah. you read. Um, and I want to talk about sound because I feel like um, I just want to ask you about sound and how sound guides you as a writer. I mean, yeah. There's so many other ways to talk about your poems. I think you talk mm -hmm. about narrative. We can talk about 
theme, we can talk about emotion, we can talk about connection, mm -hmm. but I kind of want to start by asking about sound. Yeah. Because that poem, I feel, it feels to me like it's, it's so musical. So mm. maybe, maybe in the, either the composition process or anything else, you know? Yeah. I love that question. I love talking about sound. Um, I think it is the thing for me that saved that poem. Because <laughs> otherwise it's just a list of subjects that I couldn't write about. <laughs> and I think that what happened was it just became this like, oh, I started with the word word osseous, which I like that I love that word. And I thought, oh, I'll write a poem. And then I was like, I, I don't, I don't want to use the word osseous. So then I was like, well, enough of osseous. <laughs> and then I love the way that sounded. And then it was like, oh, enough of osseous, enough of sunflower and shoot, mm -hmm. enough chickadee. And that suddenly was like, oh, this is what this is. The pleasure I'm deriving from composing at this particular moment is not in the wisdom or in sort of a knowing or in some sort of answers that I have, but it is in just trusting the sounds and just tr trusting the breath to lead me there. Um, and I didn't know where the poem would end. I thought, well, this list could go on for a really long time. <laughs> um, but, you know, then it, it ended in the idea of the physicality, that the concepts and the abstract wasn't enough. Um, and in the end, even the sound wasn't enough, right? It is the, the act, the physical act of being moved, being touched. Yeah, and I feel like there's um, something funny in a way or ironic about the words that you choose because mm -hmm. they feel like um, they are deliberately poetic, like poetic mm -hmm. kind of words, you know, so you're, but you get to have whatever rhythm expression, have your cake and eat it too, mm -hmm. right? Because you get to put them in the poem, but also like sort of push away that falseness of the, um, you know, of the poeticizing of this mm -hmm. experience. So yeah. it's, it's both there and yeah, it's amazing. It's an amazing mm -hmm. performance. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I love, I love a poem that begins with a no or a not. It's like, mm -hmm. I feel like it's like a, almost physical, like pushing away. Like, yeah. okay, now we're here in this open space. We were, um, Robert Haas the other day said that every poem that has a no in it has to have a yes in it. Every poem that has a yes in it has to have a no in it. We're all like, <laughs> we, it's like every time he talks, we're like, we just like ruin our notebooks with how fast we're scribbling. Nobody talks. He's talking. Sorry. He's talking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, no, that's great. I'm glad we started there. So, but then let's all the way to the beginning. Um, yeah. I want to talk about the title of the book. Um, I, Love this title, and I know because you know, I know each other that there were there were other titles were tried out, and then when this one clicked in, it was just perfect. Can you talk a bit about why this title, and you know what, like how it works, like as a piece of language, you know, not just what it means, but like the hurting kind. It's yeah. such an interesting phrase. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's um the phrase itself is you know from the poem in the book, mm -hmm. um and. I, I sort of resisted, like I, I, I kept loving that title for the poem. Um, and I wasn't sure if I could name a whole book, The Hurting Kind, because of the word hurt. I didn't know if I wanted that in my title. And I think there was a part of me that just resisted it. Um, and then my husband, who is also here somewhere, um, uh, re read it and was like, you know, we, we were searching for titles and I couldn't figure it out. And it, this book contains so much and I was like oh how do I get get to this thing that's going to somehow connect with all of these poems and he said I think it's the hurting kind I think it is and and um I, I tried it on for size and I have realized that I really love k sounds for one um so kind um I like the word kind in general um and then also what it meant was not so much to right it was the idea of who is the hurting kind and that it was like the people who are porous and receptive to the world and who are tender and who risk feeling and feeling deeply and i feel like we live in a world where we often only praise courage and bravery and stoicism and resilience and i wanted to take a moment to praise tenderness and to praise what it is to receive the world and to let the world hurt you sometimes 
and grief. And I just wanted to honor that. And that became, um, it became really the, the center, the center that moved, that moved the, po the poetry book forward. Yeah, I mean, it's perfect. And um, I think it's the kind of title that the more you think about it, the more meaning there is in it. I mm -hmm. mean, because there's like the hurting kind, like the hurting type, but then there's also mm -hmm. like the hurting kind, like mm -hmm. somehow like uh, kindness itself mm -hmm. is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Like in a way, like, and I think that there is a, a kind of, there's a lot of complicated emotional life in this poem mm -hmm. and this, in this, in this work. And that's why, so when I read, I thought like, oh, the hurting kind, but then the hurting, the hurting kind is in kindness. And mm -hmm. it was like, oh, they, and then, so I just like when a title of a book or a poem that teaches you how to read it. Mm -hmm. And I think that you have to read these poems and all of it is poems, um, they swivel mm -hmm. and they might look one way and then they start to shift mm -hmm. a bit and be another thing. So, so anyway, I think it's a, it's a perfect title. And um, yeah, uh, I have these illegible notes. Um, <laughs> They says, really are. It just says form exclamation <laughs> point. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Form. <laughs> no, uh, uh, no, that's not right. Um, I what I was thinking about was when I read that I now remember is that I was thinking about initially as you read the book, you see that there are many different the poems are in many different forms, not unusual for your books, I mm -hmm. would say, but handled with um, extreme confidence in this in this um, in this collection, and so we could talk about that. But I also wanted to just briefly touch on the form of the book itself. Its mm. sections. Mm. It's in. Um, this is great for me because I'm like basically the first person probably to interview, so I'm not <laughs> yet being tedious. Um, <laughs> what I want, and um, so, but the the book is in sections of um, uh, uh, titled after seasons, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you could just talk about that. Then also, they add no winter. Winter is in here. It's just not in the arc. Oh, it's not. Yeah. I mean that this is arc is a mistake. Yeah. Like the title of the section. Yeah. There's not a missing yeah, section. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Because I was like, that's weird, and I was trying to talk about that. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, can you talk a bit about the season, the choice of the seasons? Yeah. Um, I have the uncorrected. Phrase, so it says uncorrected right on there. I know. But which are which parts? <laughs> I know. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's the hard thing. All the poems. I've changed everything. Someone would tell me <laughs> <that>. <laughs> um, yeah, it's in four seasons. Uh, I and I, I was trying to really, really shapes of books. I think are um, are such a pleasure to put together books. Um, I think some people find it really frustrating, but for me, I find it really invigorating because it allows you to kind of look at everything that you've got and figure out what are the through threads and what's happening here and what matters to you. And what was really clear to me was that there wasn't going to be a narrative arc. There wasn't going to be a sort of begin here and end there. That wasn't going to be, that wasn't essential to me. Um, what was essential to me was that it had a sense of ongoingness and it had a sense of decentering myself on some levels. So that was new, was that I felt like, what was it like to actually let the book have its own life without the I? And of course, there's I in here, but um, I felt like I wanted to decenter it. And so, when the seasons, when I when I figured out that it was seasons, it was like right, because that just goes on without me, and it doesn't. I'm not involved in making that happen. Um, and I, I really that felt the truest to me. I also like the idea of cycles in general, and so for me, it was important that you could get to the end, um, and you end in winter. And then you would could go back to the beginning and, and begin again in spring. Yeah, definitely a feeling of cyclicality about it. Um, and the you are really good at ordering books of poems. Thank you. So, I really, I actually really love annoying. doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, no, it's great. It's really and and, and the book just ends on a it's a killer ending. Um, so yeah. Um, so maybe I'll ask one more. Um, there's so many things I could ask you about. And I wanted to ask you about a bit about the long poem that provides a title. Yeah. Um, so maybe I'll just, I, but you know what I really want to ask you? I want to ask you how you're doing. <laughs> I mean, the book, the book came out today. It's yeah. so weird. There's like a review in the New York Times mm -hmm. and there's like other stuff, mm -hmm. and, you know, all the skywriting, <laughs> the parachuter. No. <laughs> 
Uh, but but yeah, but I mean, all these people, they seem yeah. like super nice people, but is yeah. it scary to be out like, in the world again? Like, how are you doing? I love this question. Um, how am I doing? I ask myself that a lot, actually. Um, and it, maybe it was more so, uh, uh, you know, with the pandemic, was there was a constant like, how am I doing? How am I feeling? What's happening? Um, and I feel like today was a was really sort of wonderful, but it was like waking up and being like, oh right, it's it's book day, and then here I am, and because I'm in California, I look at my phone, you know, and it's still early, and we're still waking up, and I have so many emails <laughs> because everyone's on the East Coast is already. So I was like this moment of it felt like I woke up and I was behind, right? So today I felt like I was I've been playing catch up a little bit. Um, I actually have everyone in email be behind. Right? So, <laughs> oh, good, great. So they're gonna come out and ask questions. Ask questions yeah. Like, will you reply to my email yeah, finally? Exactly. Um, so I, I, but I'm also I feel really um, so a little overwhelmed. I think is the word. Um, but I also feel like I'm. My my husband and I say this thing, and it's been really useful to me, and I've said it to some of you here probably, but it's been really important to me that I, I put my hand on my heart and I say, okay, be present and enjoy this. And I say it all the time. And I say it before I teach, and I say it before I read. And um, I said it tonight, I said it today, and I was like, this is, I mean, this is a beautiful, I can't believe we're all here. I can't believe we get to be in a space. I can't believe I got to travel out here and do this and to celebrate this book. But I think for me is, um, for me, I think it's the best book I've written yet. Um, and uh, so I think it's overwhelmed, but overwhelmed with gratitude. Yeah, that's yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny to be here up here talking because we, I mean, they read the bios and there's like, you won this and you did that and I did this, much. but like really we're friends and yeah. it's just means it's just so great to see you. Yeah, it's great to you. see you too. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna open up to questions now and uh, um, yeah, let's, uh, do I well, do I need to do some with the mic or can people just shout? You just repeat it. Oh, I'll repeat the questions. Okay, good, I'm glad I asked that. Jenneth, yes. Hi, Jenneth. <laughs> the end you write, I'm wearing my heart on my sleeve. Mm. My heart on my sleeve. Love ends, but what if it doesn't? Mm -hmm. Matthew tells us to put the problem in the poem. Mm -hmm. My question is Did you start with that question? Mm -hmm. What if love doesn't end? Or did you just arrive there when you wrote the poem? That's a beautiful so I'm question. Supposed to repeat, just quickly repeat oh, the question, yes. which is that for the Zoom audience, is that. Um, Thank you. Was the question was, <laughs> was uh, at the end of the poem, did you start with that question? Right. Or, or was it a question that you arrived at in the writing of the poem? I think that was the Right. Question. Yeah. So it's about the poem, The Hurting Kind. At the end of that, um, it's a long poem. Um, at the end of that poem, uh, there's the line, love ends, but what if it doesn't? Um, and if you get a sticker, that's what the stickers say. Um, and um I love that you asked that, Jenneth, because I did not have any idea how to get out of that poem. That poem took me almost three years to finish. And um, because it felt endless, like it just was like, oh, I could just keep writing this particular poem for the rest of my life. And it's a poem that, um, for those of you who haven't read it, it's a poem that is um, about my grandmother and grandfather, my grandfather who passed away and my grandmother, um, they had been married for over 70 years um, and, and it's really sort of honoring their lives, um, but also that sort of strangeness of death, the processing death, the um, idea of like, oh, now you do something with when the person becomes the body, you know, all of these things. And um, I just kept thinking, well, I haven't said all the things about them that I wanted to say. And I was like, this poem, I'm never gonna get out of this poem. <laughs> and I was like, maybe that's okay, you know? Um, and maybe there'll be, you know, a, a hurting kind too in the next book. I don't know. But um, but I think the way that I arrived at that was that, oh, it is endless. 
right? And that the even the act of writing that poem was an act of love. And there's no part of my grandmother that's not still speaking to my grandfather, even though he's no longer with us. And so it was for me, not necessarily an epiphany, but a, a truth that came to me that was like, right, the only way out of this poem is to acknowledge that it doesn't end. Thank you. I feel like you do that. And I mean, I'm privy to some of your composition. Pro I feel like you launch yourself in to poems a lot of the time. And you're oh, like, yeah, I have no and then idea you're like, what's going to happen? Yeah, and like, it's, totally. it's very exciting to uh, to be privy to some. And I saw uh, many several drafts of this longer poem, I think mm -hmm. in different ways. And I, you, I was like, what, how the hell are you going to do this? Cause yeah. like, and then I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to try. It. It's amazing when that happens. Um, yeah. Some more questions. Uh, yeah. Let's get up front and then we'll get you in the back. Okay. Actually, let's start in the back. So you don't have to wait. Yes. And then we'll get you up front. After. So the question was, is there a double meaning to the title of the book? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think there is. I mean, I think we were talking about that a little bit earlier, but that sense of um, the hurting kind being the people that are the poorest people, the people that are receiving the world, being tender to the world, being open to it. Um, but also just like the deep feelers. Um, but I don't have a sort of another meaning underneath it that, you know, is, but I, you know, I'll just say that I feel like um, in the poem, The Hurting Kind, there is the line that I come from a long line of weepers. And it's, it's about that. I try to say that without weeping. Thank you for that. Your legacy is being beautifully carried forward. I hope so. <laughs> um, so yeah, you had a question. I was wondering if you could please talk about how doing the slowdown as impacted or evolved you as a poet like i absolutely love it and if you could just share a little bit about how that's changed your process that'd be great so the question was uh um how is doing the slowdown affected you as a poet and she loves it <laughs> <laughs> um i love that and i'm so glad that you listen it's funny because um i it's something i work really hard on and then um I forget that people listen to it. And so people will be like, oh yeah, you said that in the slowdown. And I was like, oh, you listen? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> like I'm always surprised. That's great. Um, you know, I think that I don't know if it necessarily has affected me as a poet, but I definitely um I've always been someone who reads extensively and reads a lot. Um, and I'm doing that even more so. So I think that's the most sort of shift that's happened is that. Um, even if I don't feel like reading, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to read a bunch of poems today and, and see what I can put on the slowdown. And um, so that has been a real delight. Um, and so I think it has opened me to, um, I think there's a lot of exciting things happening with poetry right now and, and the pushing the boundaries of what even is a poem and all of that stuff. So um, yeah, I think for me, it's just opened me up to all of these incredible new writers that are doing real work. Are you starting to gather any thoughts? I mean, you haven't been doing the slowdown, I guess, super long. A couple, how long has it been? About six months? Have you been doing it? Can't mm, remember. Longer? I think I started in July. Okay. How, do you have any, like, are you sort of gathering any general thoughts? Are you feeling like you sort of learned some stuff about poetry or American contemporary American poetry now that you are ready to share? Or are you still sort of just like? I, I mean, I, I don't like summing anything up because it always feels false. But I do feel like there is, I just think there's so much work out there that's being done and is, is undersung. And so I'm really trying to do my best to like find work that's out there that, you know, maybe maybe they have, you know, six poems out and it's like, all right, let's, let's do this poem. Um, and I feel like that's really exciting to me. So I think it's that idea that there are, I think there are a lot of really, um, is not necessarily young poets, but newer poets that are unrecognized. And um, I think that the, the further you read and the more you read in terms of journals and, you know, journals you may have only heard of once or whatever, you get really exciting things. So I find it, I mean, you just went through that experience with Best American. So it's really, I think for me, uh, I, I think it's an exciting time. 
to be reading poetry. Yeah, it's exciting and overwhelming. And um, um, I was sort of, I mean, this is, it's a, it's, it's one thing to read poems and pick them. It's another thing to have to read them aloud and sort of like become, <laughs> yeah. and I, I, I have to feel like at some point that's going to change you in all sorts of exciting ways. And mm. probably in ways that are, that will appear in your own poems and it'll yeah. be really cool to see. So yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. um, other questions? Yes. Up front. Yeah. How can writing a poem about something change your relationship with it? Mm. How can writing a poem about something change your relationship with it? What's the question? Um, well, I've always thought that there's a couple of ways that that changes. It's a great question. But I've always thought that putting attention to something is a way of loving. Like deep looking is a way of loving. Um, but I think we also have to be really careful in what we want to put our attention towards because of that. So that if we only want to spend time looking at our trauma, um, which can be really useful and healing and you can make beautiful art out of it. Um, but I think we also have to remember to pay attention to the other things too, the, any kind of joy that anything delightful, right? <laughs> anything that'll make you laugh those moments too. Um, so I feel like the more I write a poem about something, the more, the deeper attention and more connected to it. And that can go both ways, right? So that can go with something that has hurt me and it can go with something that has he healed me. And so I, for me, I'm very interested in what it is to live a balanced life. Um, and so I think I, in that searching, I have to write the balanced poems, right? The poems that do either both in the same poem or one poem that goes deep into the hurt and one poem that brings me out of the well. Yeah, and I think you do a really difficult thing, which is I think you write very close to those emotional moments and into them, but it's a dangerous thing because you can't ever lie to yourself. Mm. Because if you do, you'll write sentimental bullshit. Mm -hmm. I mean, not that I don't mind sentimental things, but but I mean, like, that you'll lie. Mm -hmm. And I, you never lie in your poems. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's like really, and I think my, that may be one of the many reasons why people love your poems, mm -hmm. because they, they're not full of lies. But they're also, <laughs> but, they're, but they're, they're also very about the big things, you know? So it's like, it's hard not to lie to yourself about the big things, like your parent, like your stepfather and your father sitting together in the car, you mm -hmm. know, that's a... Mm -hmm. You get close to that moment, there's probably, you know, there's a lot of stories you want to tell yourself about that. Yeah. So to be stern with yourself in a way, like is well, and I think that there's a certain level, especially in this book. I'm glad you brought that up because especially in this book, I think there is this level in which that we do a lot of storytelling to ourselves or allow storytelling to happen to us, mm -hmm. right? Like it was always that, like, oh, you are a child of divorce. Like that, even that sounds traumatic, kind of unnecessarily so. Like, yes, a lot of people are, you know, like, oh, you know, I don't know. So I feel like there's a sort of reclaiming um, of things, too, that I feel like um, when we ask, like, how writing a poem can change you, I think there is a level in which like, you can go back and be grateful for things or go back and be like, oh, I hadn't realized how much work that took. <laughs> to raise me or to raise my brother to raise you know like how, like what was it to to do that work and I think so often we get in these strange moments of the world has told us something was hard or we were little and it felt hard but I think it's okay to go back with any kind of new maturity that we have and recognize those other truths that are true too which mm -hmm. is what was it like for your ancestors or what was it like for your parents or what was it like for, you know? And I think um, I'm trying to do that um, with tenderness and with gratitude. Yeah, and it also connects to what you said about going in and not knowing what you're gonna write about. If you go towards those moments and you almost like deprive yourself of certainty, then you're likely more likely to find a conclusion that's, you know, really not a lie. You know? Yeah. I think. I don't know. That's I the hope. theory anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yes, up front. No. And I want to, uh, you know what? Actually, there's a question back there. Sorry, I didn't see you back there. But yeah, you back there with the mask on.
Mm. So the question was, how has Ada's relationship to the purpose of poetry mm. shifted since her earlier work or since she first started writing? That's a great question. Um, you have really good hearing. Yeah. <laughs> Is that anyone else really impressed? I mean, I'm like a little deaf in this ear and I was just like, hi, he's amazing. Um, yeah, I feel like in the very beginning of um, my making poems, <laughs> um, I, I really, I had a lot more certainty. <laughs> I think I, it's that whole sort of joke about like knowing way more when you're young and, you know, and then forgetting everything and, and, and really distrusting kind of wisdom at the, as you age. And I think that has happened to me. I think the other thing was that I was always like, no, poetry's job is to help people recommit to the world. And I was very like, this is the job of poetry. And um, now I realize it's, oh, its job is to help me recommit to the world. And that is the job <laughs> of poetry for me, the purpose of poetry for me. And that if along the way, someone else has changed or moved or touched by it, that's beautiful. And I love that, but um, I, can't write poems with that in mind. I think that it would be too overwhelming and too silencing actually to think too much about what might happen to a reader. And so instead I just have to think about what's true for me. Beautiful. Yes. Well, so I was I was excited that you were talking about sound and delight because I was delighted by the sounds of all the specific natural names of things mm. and you know like uh some in the last poem just a lung chickadee and sansara and shoot and then i looked in the one before you know kairos teller yana linden and and they, i heard a lot of these words that are so wonderful that i could imagine just putting any of them in a row and it would be just delightful to listen to mm. i just wondered how that is for you, and if you sometimes have to look them up, or if you become a person who knows the name of every plant and animal, and 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 discovers these fabulous musical, you know, textures mm. and sounds mm. that are their meaning. Mm -hmm. Want to repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> I was just kind of mesmerized with the question. I can I can actually uh, repeat yeah. it. I can I can put it into the I can put it into the answer. Um. The question is uh, sort of whether or not um, the, some of the work, that, the sounds that are driving the work are the, the names of specific plants and trees and animals. And, and she was asking whether or not um, I'm someone who has to look these things up or if I'm someone who can look at something and know what they are and you know what it is that sort of building texture from those specific names. And um, I am someone that has to look them up. But the nice thing is that once I put them in a poem, I, I never forget them. Uh -huh. um, and so that really helps me. But I am, uh, I do know a lot of fauna and flora um, and it is an obsession of mine. But I also am the person that will look at a tree and be like, I know it's an oak, but there are 450 species of oaks, you know? <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm not gonna land on whatever the right one. But, um, but I do like identifying as a way of sort of connecting. Um, and that seems important to me, but I love the music of names and the music of specificity. I mean, it, it, to me, that's just delightful, even of place, right? Like the way things are said and the way, the sounds of things and- um, Drowning Creek. Yeah, Drowning Creek and, and exploring that. So for, for me that the music in those things are um, sometimes accidental, but, um, there's definitely an obsession of mine. I have like total tree phasia because like I cannot, I, I got like, maybe I got oak and elm. I cannot remember. It's horrible. I, I yeah, I need an app. Um, yes. They exist. <laughs> yes, I pointed to you. Mm -hmm. However you want to say that. Um, and and it, I've read your prior collections and I look up to you so much. And it, and you embrace me when I make you think so fearless. Mm. And I I don't know if it's an answer to the question, but I just wonder what scared you mm. about this book, what it's talking about. Mm. 
Ada, what scared you yeah. about this book? <laughs> yeah. A lot, I bet. Well, I think that's a beautiful question. I think that for me, I really had to trust that there wasn't an aboutness because in both Bright Dead Things and The Carrying, there was like the Bright Dead Things was very focused on my move to Kentucky and um, the death of my stepmother and how those two things kind of work together. And then um, the carrying was very much centered around infertility. Um, there was many other things happening, but that was, you know, a central theme. And this book, it, the, the central theme is really like nature and looking and ancestors and animals. And I really, I think the hardest thing for me to surrender to was that this wasn't a book about necessarily me. It was, a, I mean, it is, there's, I'm in there, but that it was really about things that are larger than me. And that it's, the, it's, a, it's a book that's more of an offering. It's more of an outward thing, which I think is why I, it's my favorite book so far, is because for me, it feels like it is like an offering. It goes like this. And that, um, that gesture is an important thing that helped me actually kind of get through the fear of, of making a book that in some ways didn't have that aboutness or narrative thread that a reviewer can kind of pick out and be like, oh, this is what this book is about. And we always laugh about that in class. And, and my students have heard me say this, which is when someone says like, what, your, what are your poems about? Sure. It's like the strangest, I don't know, I still, I can't answer that question, right? It's like, well, they're about like, you know, love and sex and death and grief and mortality and animals and trees and plants and birds. I mean, it's just like, you can't. <laughs> They're just I'm always about, just like, what do you mean by what do you mean by about? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do you mean by poems? <laughs> so you? yeah, so I think it was really embracing that the the book is 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 um is less narrative in some ways, mm -hmm. and 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 for me that felt really important right now. Um, I see. I'm gonna do a little line. I'm gonna do right here in the front, and then there's a young person in the back that I'm gonna ask. Let me start here in the front. Hi, thanks so much. I'm, I'm just very curious about some of your initial observations and in going from, I believe you said the Bay Area to Kentucky, mm. and that's huge. Mm. And clearly it's influenced this book mm. in some way. Mm. So is there anything that struck you when you first landed there, like, whoa? Yeah. Are there any differences between the Bay Area? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there was a lot happening at that time in my life when I moved there. It's been 12 years now, but, um, I was, um, I was actually coming from New York. I was living in New York, um, for that 10 to 12 years. And then, um, I really also quit my job and then, you know, quit my job, fell in love and moved in with my now husband. In Kentucky. So there were so many elements to all of that shifting, which was, you know, here I was now like trying to be a writer full time, which completely just meant freelancing for magazines. Um, because I was like, and I also need to pay my rent. Um, and then um, but it was it, but it was more space and more time. And so I think Kentucky for me has always really been about. I didn't know that I needed that space and time. And the city living that I was doing in New York was not offering me that um, based on the, just the pace and what you needed to do to just afford a tiny little apartment in Brooklyn. Um, you know, uh, that was a huge thing. I mean, you, we don't talk about cost of living that much as artists, but I think, you know, what was the number one thing? Who, who was it that said the number one writing advice to give is low overhead. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, and I always think about that because I think, you know, that's what Kentucky in some ways has really provided me. And, um, but I also think it was getting to know new natural spaces, you know, looking at a tree and being like, oh, that's a sweet gum, you know? And I didn't know that that was a tree and sweet gum is a great name of a tree. And mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, so getting to, sort of reinvestigate a landscape that wasn't necessarily a coming home, um, felt kind of like being on a different planet. 
Yeah, and if you're interested, I mean, I recommend Bright Dead Things. It's the it is collection that really explicitly deals with that duality of place. It's very like so. If you're curious about them more, yeah, I think so. I think with one more question or two, or what do we have time? An online one. Okay, so why don't we why don't we have the person behind you ask, and then maybe the online one to finish up with? Does that sound? You yes, I you yes. <laughs> Can I just say these questions are fucking great? I was just going to say, I was just like, blown away. Yeah, yeah, that's a great. So I guess I think I don't want to put words in your mouth. I think you were asking if there are certain feelings that have continued through the whole all six collections you said mm -hmm. that are that feel never ending to you. Is mm -hmm. that what you were asking about? And that feel like endless in the same way that poem, the hurting kind of. Yeah, that's is that, great. Was that basically what you were asking. Yeah, like, has it really ah. Yeah, yeah. And has your relationship to them changed? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I just fall over. <laughs> um, I think that for me, like the, the things that have, you know, the sort of ongoing issues of life, right? Someone asked me one time, like, well, what question do you always ask yourself? And I said, yeah, um, how do we live? And I think that question is always somewhere in my work. How do we live? How do we live with the knowledge that we will die? How do we live with the knowledge that our loved ones will die? How do we live fully, right, and presently, and also in a world that doesn't necessarily nourish us <laughs> as artists? Um, those are always ongoing. And I think in the first book, Lucky Wreck, I was very much interested in what it was to sort of discover mortality. And I say discover because I was in my 30s and were in my 20s and some of those poems were being written. And it really was like, oh, we're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I, in those weird moments where you're like, I know I should be, I should be, have been younger when I figured this out. <laughs> um, but that is at the core, I think, of everything for me um, because it, it, it puts things in a perspective, right? So I think in the earlier work, the issues with mortality felt like they were a little bit maybe philosophical. And I think now as I've aged more and lost more people or even had health scares myself, there, it becomes more inevitable. And I think there's a more surrendering and a releasing that's happening in my idea of what will continue on without me, as opposed to the tenacity of holding on. Those things are shifting, I think, in my work. Um, so we have an online question. Um, but, and so after that, do you all think that I should implore Ada to read one last poem for us before we go? Yeah, I would love that. Okay, good. So well, let's hear the online question. <laughs> Oh. Can you talk about the um, I guess it's about the <laughs> relationship between uh, <laughs> Uh, you, the title of the book and your idea of doing great. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great question. I guess. It's an amazing Sorry. question. Um, I think the, the idea of like if there is a sort of relationship between um, the hurting kind, who I am, and whether something has happened to me that made me see hurt or past hurt as abundance. Um, it's just. just specifically looking at the poem Joint Custody, um, which is about rethinking about going into two households and this um, 
idea of like why and it, it begins with why did I never see it for what it was abundance and I think that sometimes we forget that and again I think that's a narrative that is told to us right that your family is broken when really it's more full you know and I feel like that's one of the things I I'm very interested in rethinking about narratives that we just sort of picked up because someone told us and I'm very proud of my parents for choosing love and happiness. I think that's wonderful. And I am so pro splitting up if you need to be, do that to be healthy and whole and healed. And I feel like that is that sort of, so I don't know if there's nothing necessarily something that's happened to my, in my life that has led me there. But I do think that I am very suspicious of the narratives that are given to us from society, which really are just unhelpful myths. I love that. I love that you're um, having me read this poem because this is a poem for my father and um, my dearest darling father had a uh, pretty intense surgery today and he's doing okay. But um, so he's been on my mind and I wasn't sure if I could read it because, you know, but he's doing okay. Um, my father's mustache. Let us pause to applaud the white bell bottom suit. <laughs> the wide flared collar, the black thick coiffed hair, in this photo, my father has sent of himself at a gathering off Sonoma Highway in the early 70s. I can't stop looking at the photo. There is a swagger that feels almost otherworldly, epic, like Lorca expounding in Buenos Aires, not the form, but the marrow of form. He is perfect there, my father in the photo. I feel Somehow I'm perched on a bay laurel branch nearby, though not born yet. It is black and white, the photo. You can see his grin behind his lush mustache. Is it time that moves in me now? A sense of ache and unraveling. My father in his pristine white suit, the eye of the world barely able to handle his smooth, unbroken stride. It's been a year since I've seen him in person. I miss how he points to his apple trees and I miss his smooth face that no longer has the mustache I always adored. As a child, I once cried when he shaved it. Even then, I was too attached to this life. So I think uh, books to be signed by Ada, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and please, um, I guess I always, if I do anything in any kind of bookstore, I always say, um, please buy something. <laughs> uh, it would be awesome if you buy this book, of course, but even if you can't, because maybe like a postcard, like anything, just let's keep these people in business. Yeah. They're yes. the best. So okay, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Um, can I get one more hand to Ada and Matthew? <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a real honor and privilege, and what a sparkling evening. To, mm -hmm. We are going to have, I was going to have Ada sign at the back desk, but if you okay. no, that's great. Right. 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 You are welcome to. No, I, um, I have instructions for this sign crowd. Um, so we are going to have Ada sign at the back desk where um, your proof of vax was checked. There's a, a vase of flowers. There, if you do not know where to go, I will gladly tell you where to go. Um, and please do um, heed Matthew's advice. Um, I am happy and also um, a little sad to report that we're completely sold out of copies of his books, so, which is great um, for her. <laughs> <laughs> 
which is really wonderful. And I will say too that we're happy to special order a copy for you. It all arrives here in two to three business days. You can have it shipped to your house, um, whatever we would. Uh, I would certainly yeah, advise uh, purchasing it. So you have it, you have this momentum, you have this good feeling inside of you. <laughs> um, and we're also not Amazon. So there you um, go. Yeah. Um, I am so appreciative of you all for being here. I will keep it brief and let's keep it moving. Thank you so kindly. And we'll be at the back end. Thank you so much. I'm going to go get my mask. Okay, great. Amazing. You are amazing.